Good evening, everybody, and um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, this is the first of our, uh, I guess, autumn and winter season of talks and presentations. We've got all sorts of exciting things coming up um, over the course of the coming weeks. We've got talks about Brazil and India and Zambia and Alaska and various places in the UK, and we've got other things planned for you in the new year. Um, but to begin with, uh, we are going to be hearing all about Baja California, which is probably, no, definitely one of my favourite places in the world. Um, one of my favourite three, I reckon. Where did you reckon the other two are, Mark? Zambia. Yep. And South Georgia. Well, okay, I'm now going to have to extend my favourite three to being favourite four. <laughs> I guess I was going to say the Great Bear Rainforest. Oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, certainly. It's certainly right up there. So so this evening, we're going to hear all about Baja California uh, from Mark, uh, who is a past master. Um, Mark will be known to many of you. Well, a couple of you anyway, maybe not all of you. Uh, but Mark, of course, is a past master when it comes to Baja California and all sorts of other amazing places around the world. But um, how long have you been going to Baja, Mark? Uh, my first visit was 1991. And I worked out the other day that the next time I go in February will be my 90th visit, 9 0. Good gracious. So, big moment. Yeah. That'll almost be like your 90th birthday. So you've just gone quiet. I can't hear you anymore. <laughs> I picked whining sound. <laughs> um, 90 trips. Wow, that's incredible. So um, one of the things I just need to mention to those of you that are online is about the Q&A, um, which lots of you have already found, um, and the webinar chat, which I know a lot of you have also already found. Um, please do feel free to ask questions, post things in Q&A and post things in chat during the course of Mark's presentation. Um, and I'll be able to answer some of those things during the course of the uh, during the course of the presentation. But we'll have a QA and a session at the end. Um, a bit more of an intro to Mark really is probably required. Um, and uh, highly appropriate, of course, um, which is that uh, for those of you that don't read BBC Wildlife magazine, which I imagine is very few of you, but you will have seen Mark in BBC Wildlife magazine um, in his regular um, and I have to say excellent uh, column about um, uh, various uh, potentially controversial um, wildlife matters, which is what we like. Um, things that make you think and ask questions and challenge, which is brilliant. I'm sure many of you will have seen Last Chance to See, which Mark did with Stephen Fry, an absolutely tremendous TV series. Um, and Mark has, of course, written numerous books. Um, but every time Mark writes a book, he says it's the last one he's going to write. But actually, the last one you said you were going to write, Mark, I think was that one, wasn't it? Mm hmm. Yeah. Probably, no, definitely the most comprehensive guide to whales, dolphins and porpoises in the world. It's an absolutely fantastic book. And if you don't have it, um, I would uh, strongly recommend that you get it. And there's also a field guide as well, which was yeah, the book. Other things there as well. I, I completely failed on the never going to write another book. Yeah, I think you wrote the field guide after writing that, which was the yeah. last one you said you were ever going to write. Mm -hmm. And I have a sense that you may have written one or two others since, haven't you? Or at least they're in. Yeah, a couple more. <laughs> um well look mark i'm gonna hand over to you um i'll disappear for a minute um or perhaps more than a minute uh whilst you do your presentation um and as i say to everybody on board please do ask questions we'll have a q a session at the end i'll come back on and mark and i'll have a chat about baja um but um i would say uh, settle in for a, a super uh evening of some wonderful images and some great chat about baja over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Chris. And hello, everybody. I'm sorry I can't see you. Before the end of the evening, I'll try and uh, work out how to uh, get
get to see who's there and say hello. I'm sure I know a lot of you. Um, so what I'm going to do this evening is to to rave a lot about what we've just already said is one of our favourite places on the planet. Um, and I have been going there for a long time, but I still look forward to every single visit. Never think, oh, you're going back to Baja. It's not like that at all. I'm sure a lot of you I know have been multiple times. And um, I think it is addictive. It's one of those places that every time you go, you see something different. Um, so if you haven't been, hope this will inspire you. If you have been, then I hope it'll bring back lots of happy memories. Um, you may even recognise some of the individual whales, I think. I certainly have got to know some whales, certainly some of the grey whales and a few humpbacks. And there's a, a blue fin hybrid that we see quite a few times over the years. So I recognise individual whales as well. So I'll try and keep it fairly short, maybe 35 minutes or so, um, see how it goes. I might just whiz through a variety of pictures uh, just to give you a taste of the kind of things we see and not talk about everything, but we'll see how it goes. This is a, a, a humpback whale mum and calf in a breaching lesson. We've seen this a few times now where the calf does a few breaches and then um, the mum does one say, no, 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 this is how you do it. She does one. Then the calf does a few more. Then they do one together. And it's it's absolutely a lesson. There's no way she's not teaching that half calf how to leap out of the water and uh, and learn how to do it properly. That was off the, the southern tip of Baja. Um, I've been going for, um, let me just see if I can't get this to move here. Um, I've been going to Baja for all sorts of different reasons. I first started going actually to do aerial surveys of blue whales. We had this wonderful trip every year where we'd fly from the northern end on the Pacific coast in zigzags, doing transects all the way down the Pacific coast to Baja and then all the way up the Sea of Cortez Hunting blue whales and other other whales that we saw along the way. That was really my first sort of introduction to what a wonderful place it is. Um, and I've been going for other reasons as well. Shark diving. Um, there's some wonderful cage diving with great white sharks off an island called Guadalupe, which we don't go to on this trip, but it's off the coast of Baja. And it is the best place, I think, on the planet for seeing great whites in that lovely blue open ocean water that was actually taken from inside a cage um, but it is a wonderful way to see them uh, and it, it is probably the best place to do it and I've been there filming a few times I've uh, filmed Big Blue Live filmed uh, Last Chance to See that, um, that you just heard about with Stephen Fry um, we spent a few weeks in Baja filming the whales and all the other wildlife and talking about what a wonderful place it is and talking about conservation and so on I don't know if you can see how big your screen is Stephen's got his lucky whale watching shorts on, which seemed to work pretty well. We had some amazing whale encounters during that filming trip. And here we are again, not looking so happy. We had to ride these mules. Uh, we were both scared of horses and mules, actually. I, I can snork with great white sharks, no problem at all. Put me on a horse or a mule and I'm shaking. And um, Stephen, as you can see by his face, doesn't like it either. Don't feel at all safe. But that was on that same filming trip going up into the mountains in the interior. So let me introduce where we're talking about. Uh, here's North America, and here is Baja. Uh, it's in the northwest coast of Mexico. I would say it looks a bit like a, it's a bit shaped a bit like a giant chili stuck off the coast there. This is one of my favorite NASA photos. This is from a, a NASA satellite taken in, I think, 2011. Um, which really shows the peninsula to perfection. So give you an idea of the scale, it's 775 miles long. So right at the northern end of the peninsula is the US border. Just over the border is San Diego on the, on the coastal side. And it's 770 miles all the way from there down to the southern tip. And you've got the, it's actually one of the longest peninsulas in the world. To give you an idea of the, the scale again, the area of the peninsula is roughly the same as England and Wales combined. So we're interested in the marine part of it mostly. So on the, on the left-hand side, the west side is the North Pacific, and on the right side, the uh, east side, is the Sea of Cortez or, or Gulf of California. Talk about that in a moment. And the whole region, the whole peninsula is actually one of the most biologically rich marine systems anywhere in the world. And it's the wildlife I'll focus on mostly this evening. I'll tell you a few other things as well. Um, but it never ceases to amaze me how much variety and how much we see during these trips. I mean, we're there really to see the, the whales and dolphins. 
Um, but of course, when you're traveling around, it's hard not to bump into other stuff. So we often see ocean sunfish like this. I think they're like a, it's like a giant fish head with a couple of fins stuck on. Um, its body, of course, is flattened laterally. It's called a sunfish because it, it really does sunbathe. So it dives down to great depths, maybe a couple of thousand feet um, in the cold to feed on jellyfish. And then it comes back up to the surface to do what we call thermally recharging, sunbathing, warming up. And it does that. It just lies on the surface, flaps about a bit. And then when it's ready, when it's warmed up, it goes back down to the depth. So we often see them lying on the surface like that. This, this particular individual was about six feet long, about the same as me. If I lay on there, it'd be about the same length as me. They can grow a lot bigger, up to about 10 feet. Uh, here's another smaller one that we came across right by the side of the boat. We do see sharks sometimes as well. I, I love this photo. I just love the, the water. It just makes it look like a piece of artwork rather than a photograph. So that's a, a juvenile scalloped hammerhead shark. Um, just came along the side of the boat. Um, saw it off in the distance with the fin just breaking the surface and we slowed down, came right along the side of the boat. They used to be really common. I used to do shark diving trips to see them in the Sea of Cortez. Uh, there's a couple of places, there's a, a sea mount called El Bajo and there's a, a little islet we go to somewhere called Las Animas. Um, and they used to be hammerhead gathering grounds. So you do a dive and on a typical dive, you see 500 hammerheads in a single dive. Sadly, in the 90s and 2000s, early 2000s, they got fished out, as in many parts of the world. The sharks were taken by fishermen, the fins cut off, the live animals thrown overboard, and the fins sold for the Chinese um, shark fin soup trade. Um, but with protection, they're coming back again, and we do see them more and more from the boat. And it, it's interesting because dive tourism is taking off in Baja nowadays, um, much more than it was when the sharks were being fished and dive tourism, diving to see sharks and all sorts of other wildlife is actually now worth more than fishing, fishing of all sorts in the Sea of Cortez. So it's a really important part of conservation strategy. And then you see things just leap out of the water. You know, this is a striped marlin just suddenly leaps out of the water three or four times and then disappears. Loads of birds follow us on the roots. This is a Heerman's gull. I think it's one of the most beautiful gulls on the planet. Really, really beautiful looking bird. We see those a lot. All sorts of things like spectacular red-billed tropic bird. This is an adult with its beautiful red bill and the long white tail streamers, which we often see. There's some albatross as well. This is a black-footed albatross. And these things we just see by chance, of course, as we're traveling south along the Pacific coast and then north in the Sea of Cortez. We often see turtles. Uh, there's five different species of sea turtle out of the world, seven, not bad, uh, that we see in the Sea of Cortez particularly, but also on the Pacific coast, and all sorts of marine mammals, several species of seal. Uh, this is a California sea lion, which is, it's ubiquitous. We see California sea lions throughout the whole trip. You can't miss those. They're, they're all over the place. It's, it's the hotspot for California sea lions. And of course, as I'm going to talk about much more, loads of, of dolphins and, and whales. This is a, a common dolphin. Not that long, long ago, they were split. These used to be um, short-beaked common dolphin and long-beaked common dolphins, two separate species. And I could, I could never see it. I could never see the difference. You'd get the two extremes in single schools. Um, it just didn't make sense to me and many other people. And now it's all back to one species. So I can happily say, without worrying about it, that is simply a common dolphin. And of course, the real focus of the trips, uh, whales. Um, this is a fin whale in the Sea of Cortez. Uh, there's a little resident population of fin whales in the Sea of Cortez, three or four hundred of them. And we see those regularly, actually on both sides. There's also fin whales feeding um, off the Pacific coast of the Sea of Cortez. And I think the thing that Baja is probably most famous for is the friendliest whales in the world. And I'm not exaggerating. They really are the friendliest whales in the world. This is in a place called San Ignacio Lagoon, uh, which we'll be visiting early on in the trip. And um, I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. But that's the sort of encounter that literally changes people's lives. And it still blows me away. I've done it hundreds and hundreds of times now. And every time I can't believe it's real, it really happens. But we'll talk about that in a minute. 
So why is it so rich? Well, one reason is that you've got cold, very nutrient-rich waters flowing down the Pacific coast of Baja. This is the what's called the California Current. And that starts sort of southern British Columbia, flows all the way down the coast of the, the west coast of the States and down the west coast of the Baja Peninsula. And that is the source of this amazingly rich food chain. And then the other side of the uh, Baja Peninsula in the Sea of Cortez, it's very different. It's, it's warm. It's mostly subtropical waters. Um, actually, the Tropic of Cancer cuts through the bottom of the peninsula, about 50 miles north of the bottom of the peninsula. So <laughs> the last little bit is officially in the tropics. But the thing about the Sea of Cortez, you've got the warm water, which makes it a great breeding ground for whales, as well as a feeding ground. But you've also got fantastic upwelling. So that also has very high productivity uh, for, for slightly different reasons. And it, it's so rich. Jacques Cousteau famously described the Sea of Cortez as the aquarium of the world, the world's aquarium. And of course, most people have heard of it because of John Steinbeck's The Log from the Sea of Cortez, which is definitely worth a, a read. It's named after um, a Spanish conquistador, I suppose would be the right term, called Hernán Cortés. Um, and in the 16th century, he claimed Mexico for Spain and the sea was named after him. Americans generally call it the Gulf of California um, and the two names are, are sort of interchangeable. I tend to prefer to call it, call it the, the Sea of Cortez. So it came about all because of plate tectonics. So I'm definitely not a geologist, but this is fairly simple. So the Baja Peninsula sits on the Pacific plate and the rest of Mexico sits on the um, American plate. And they're basically separating. So the Pacific plate with Baja is gradually moving northwest. And the uh, American plate with the rest of Mexico is moving southeast. And so gradually they've split. And about six million years ago, something like that, Baja broke away from the Mexican mainland and the sea rushed in and that formed the Sea of Cortez. Um, and in fact, it, you can see a little fault line going through the, the centre of the Sea of Cortez. That's an extension of the San Andreas Fault, which um, is, is the tectonic boundary between the two plates, of course. Um, and they're still moving apart. So they reckon, geologists reckon, it's an average of a couple of inches a year, which is roughly the same as our fingernails grow. So it's very slow. But I guess maybe one day in years to come, many years to come, when we're still running this trip, Baja will have broken off and it'll be a, it'll be a separate island. Who knows? It's the same principle as all continents breaking apart. So Africa broke away from the South American continent, uh, what, 130 million years or so, or so ago. Same principle with Baja on a much smaller scale. So people have been living there for a long time. The, these are cave paintings. Um, actually, that's where Stephen Fry and I were going on our scary mules to look at these cave paintings in the middle of Baja. And they've been radiocarbon dated uh, to 11,000 years ago. So there have been people living in the region for at least 11,000 years. The name Baja, just to, to put it into perspective, because when you say to friends, you know, I'm going to Baja, California, they nearly always say, oh, California. And you say, no, 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 Baja, California, it's different. And the reason it's all got the same name is, is basically, so, and again, I'm not a historian, I'm going to keep it really simple. So Spain used to have this vast empire, which in 1768, something like that, it named the province of the Californias. And this empire included the Baja Peninsula, um, the entire US, what are now the US states of California, Nevada, Utah, and then parts of other states like Arizona, Wyoming, New Mexico, Colorado, that kind of thing. And that whole region was called the province of the Californias. So then Mexico got independence from Spain, and that was in 1821, and it got this whole empire, and it divided it into two halves for some reason. Um, one was Alta California, which was Upper California, which is all the American bit, as it, as it is now. And the other was Baja California, Lower California, which is what we know as Baja California in Mexico. Um, and in fact, it then all changed again. So in 1850, control of the American part of it, hope you're following me on this, um, all went to the States. It, it wasn't that simple. It was three years after the, the war. 
um, between Mexico and the States, Mexico basically sold that whole region of Upper California, all those states, to America for $15 million. And they kept Baja. I think they kept the right part of it. But I think the Americans got a good deal. And now um, Baja basically consists of two Mexican states, Baja California Norte, which is north, and Baja California Sur, which is south. Out of 31, you can see all the states, 31 states in Mexico um, on that map there. So it's two of the 31 states. Now, nowadays, not that many people live there. So if you remember, I said that the, the whole of the peninsula is roughly the same area as England and Wales combined. Um, population of England and Wales roughly is 70 million, something like that. Well, the population of Baja is just over 4 million. And most of those people live in those big cities I've marked on the map. So Tijuana, just over 2 million. Mexicali, just over 1 million. Ensenada, 350,000 and so on. La Paz, quarter of a million. And Cabo San Lucas, 200,000. So, so when you add that lot up, there's virtually nobody in the rest of the peninsula, which is great because it is pure wilderness. It's just really, really wild and for the wildlife. And that's one of the many things I love about it. And the reason there's hardly anybody there is because most of Baja is absolutely uninhabitable. It's arid desert scrubland like you can see here with very, very limited fresh water supply. And that is the, the big limiting factor why people are focused on those few towns and cities. I mean, not completely desolate. You know, you do get uh, loads of wonderful cacti and there's all sorts of animals living in the desert. This is a, an amazing thing called a rattleless rattlesnake, which I know lots of you have seen with me. They only live on one island in the Sea of Cortez, Santa Catalina Island. The official name is Santa Catalina Island rattleless rattlesnake and nowhere else on the planet. And as its name suggests, when it shakes its rattle, like other rattlesnakes do, it does do that shaking, but it doesn't make a sound, it's completely silent. Maybe, maybe lost the rattle, the bits inside the rattle that make the sound, because it doesn't need it. There's no big natural predators on the island. Sadly, we're no longer allowed to visit Santa Catalina, because can you believe people are going there and stealing the rattleless rattlesnakes uh, to sell to wildlife traffickers, raising vast amounts of money each snake so complete no go area at the moment, no go area at the moment. And there's all sorts of other wonderful, weird and wonderful wildlife. This is a Zantu's hummingbird. Another that was actually some people we used to know who used to camp on a beach. I used to go and visit them because they fed birds in their garden. And one of the birds they got regularly was Zantu's hummingbird. It was the easiest way to see them. We found some other places since. Um, and I just love that because it shows how tiny the bird is against the pegs. And this is also only found in Baja, only found in a small part of central and southern Baja, nowhere else on the planet, because the Zantu's hummingbird. So let me talk about the trip and what we get up to. So first of all, we start, where are we leaving from? We fly to Mexico City, and then from there on to Cabo San Lucas, which is on the, the southern end of the Baja Peninsula. Here's Cabo. And we stay one night in Mexico City and one night in Cabo. And then this is when the fun really begins. We then fly from in a little chartered plane. Oh, don't know why I did that. Fly from Cabo San Lucas to San Ignacio Lagoon. A spectacular flight along the coast. So you see that I can't point on this map, but um, about halfway there is a, is a big lagoon area. That's Magdalena Bay, which is another breeding ground for grey whales. So we fly over Magdalena Bay. Get great views of that and other places along the coast. And then we land on a, a sandy airstrip on the edge of San Ignacio Lagoon. And we actually stay in a, a camp. I've not been to this camp myself. Um, I've been to, there's seven camps around the coast of San Ignacio Lagoon. And I've stayed in most of the others, but not this posh one. And this is the poshest, the most luxurious. And with our private ensuite facilities, all that, that, all that kind of stuff. Um, and we're going to be staying in these tents um, for three nights, right on the edge of the lagoon. So you can see the water of the lagoon where the, the whales live, literally offshore there. And staying in the camps is a, is a nice thing to do because you get a different feel for the lagoon um, than watching from the boat, which we do as well. So around the camps are typically coyotes. I mean, many times I've been having a shower in one of these camps and I've heard this 
sound and it's coyotes licking the water from the shower dripping out of the back. Again, so little water, that's an easy source of water for them. There's always ospreys around the camp. They often nest on the tent roofs or there was one camp I remember which had a separate toilet block and there was an osprey nest on the top of the toilet block. And every time somebody went to the toilet, the poor osprey flew off and then they shut the door and it came back down again. They finished their ablutions, came out, osprey took off again. It was like this all day long. And somehow this pair managed to raise three chicks. Amazing. On the top of a toilet block. So here is the lagoon. Um, it's about 16 miles long altogether. And this is San Ignacio Lagoon. And this is one of the main lagoons where grey whales go to breed every winter. And that's what we're going there for. So we'll be going out in small little boats like this. And these are run by local fishermen. There's a fantastic arrangement in San Ignacio where the local fishermen have exclusive rights to whale watching. No one else can take their boats out whale watching there. And in return, apart from making the money, uh, earning the living, their living from the whale watching, they remove all their fishing nets, their traps, their fishing lines and all the other paraphernalia from the lagoon while the grey whales are there. And so the whales are completely safe and the fishermen have a vested interest in protecting them. So, and, and of course, because they do it day in, day out, week in, week out, year after year, they are the world experts on whale watching there. They, they actually recognise a huge number of the whales that come into the lagoon. And it's a spectacular place to be. So the whales feed in Arctic waters, then they stop feeding, migrate all the way down the, the west coast of North America, turn up in San Ignacio, and there are three other breeding lagoons they go to. And then they, they spend the winter in these lagoons. Um, and on a good day, there can be literally hundreds of them milling around in this relatively small lagoon, mostly near the mouth. They can, they can go anywhere in the lagoon, but they're mostly in the mouth, which is where the camps are, where we do our whale watching. And I think what happens there is the whales are bored, basically. So the, the males just have to mate with females, and that doesn't take all day, every day. And the females have to just feed their calves milk, nurse their calves, and the calves just have to get older and bigger and wiser. And so most of them have got very little to do for most of the day. And that's basically where we come in. Um, and we basically fill the time, keep them entertained. And doing so, I think, is it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say, and those of you who have been hopefully will agree with me, is, is probably one of those extraordinary, mind-boggling, life-changing experiences on the planet. And we got two and a half, two full days and two half days based in the camp just spending time with these grey whales. And it's often almost impossible to tell who's supposed to be watching who, because we go out and pay good money to see them, and they come to us for these extraordinary close encounters. I think that said it all, that's one of my nieces, Zoe, having quite a good day with a friendly grey whale. It's hard to believe that in the old days of whaling, you know, talking like the, the second half of the 19th century and the early 20th century, um, when whalers rode into San Ignacio Lagoon in boats of similar size and harpooned the grey whales and almost wiped them out. I mean, they almost went extinct. And yet here we are, not that long later, maybe within the lifetime, the, the living memory of some of the older grey whales there, here we are in the lagoon in boats of similar size and they're welcoming us with open not arms, flippers. And they seem to understand that nowadays, thank goodness, we come in peace and treat us like old friends. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, is this a good thing? Should we be touching wild animals? You know, in many ways, it goes against the grain of everything else we do with wildlife. There's, there's no whispering, there's no stalking, there's no camouflage. You make as much noise as you like. You can splash water. They love being splashed. You can sing and do whatever you want. And that's what it's all about, watching the whales here. It just maybe to some people feels wrong. Well, we could, if there's time, we could maybe talk about this at the end a bit more. But having done it for so many years, I have no qualms whatsoever. Not touching wildlife is a policy that we should all um, agree to and abide by all over the world. You know, you mustn't touch gorillas and you mustn't touch this and that. I think this is the one exception. And to put it simply, let me let me tell you three things. One is that it's been happening since 1972. That's how long these whales have been having these friendly encounters with people when they first started 
being friendly of their own accord with fishermen before there were any tourists anywhere near the lagoon. And there's been no evidence of disease transmission or stopping any of their natural behaviour. Secondly, it is entirely on their terms. We've done experiments where one boat goes out and everyone sits on their hands and doesn't do anything. And another boat goes out and everyone splashes and makes a noise. And when the whales come over, they scratch and tickle them. And if, if you don't do that, if you're a boat sitting on your hands, they'll ignore you and they go and find a boatload of people who will do it. And it's very much on their terms. And thirdly, that friendly behavior is what's kept them safe. It gives the local people a reason to protect them. And it's a long story, but it's, I can maybe explain this at the end if there's more time. But there was going to be a salt extraction plant built on the shores of San Ignacio Lagoon, which would have destroyed the lagoon and made it impossible for the whales to breed there. There's a long campaign to try and stop it. And then the president of Mexico at the time, Zadio, President Zadio, went with his family to meet these friendly grey whales. The whales did their own campaigning. The president scratched and tickled one and the project was cancelled the next day. So the friendly behaviours basically saved them and saved San Ignacio Lagoon. And in fact, you know, you often see mother female grey whales pushing their calves up. The calves are often a bit nervous, but they push them up to the boats to force them to play. Um, which is which is wonderful to see. So it very much is down to them. So we, we spend that time three nights in the in the luxury camp. Then we join the spirit of adventure, this big boat here. Um, and we spend the next eight nights. This is our home for the next eight nights. And uh, we'll spend another couple of days in the lagoon because you, you can't get enough of these friendly grey whales going out with the same Mexican fishermen, more friendly encounters with them. But this time we'll be based on the boat. Now, it's, it's not a luxurious boat, it's not luxurious like the camp, but what I would say is everyone I know who's been on it has grown to love it. I, I love it. It's a fantastic boat for this trip. Um, the food is superb. The crew are fantastic, really attentive. There's loads of deck space. It's the perfect boat for whale watching. And yeah, the cabins are small. People often ask about that. But the reality is you spend all your time out on deck or in the galley chatting and eating and so on. So um, you spend so little time in the cabin, storing kit and sleeping, and that's it. And the other benefits are huge. So there's that big deck space, you can walk all the way around the boat. There's other places to watch above. There's a great, you can't quite see it there in front of the wheelhouse, a great little deck to get a higher view. And as you can see there, the whales will often come right up to the boat. So in the lagoon, the whales again, I'm sure aboard, they come and investigate the boat. And they'll hang around the big boat and spend time just rolling there, scratching. This is one rubbing on the anchor rope. Often warn people who stay in the cabin at the very front of the boat. You might get woken up in the night by <laughs> noise, and it's a grey whale rubbing itself on the anchor rope or the anchor chain. And here's a mum and a calf coming up to the Spirit of Adventure in the lagoon. And one of the crew is actually brushing the calf with a brush, and it's rolling around do under its flippers, under the other flipper, under its chin, back on the top of the head, having a fantastic time while the, the, while the crew member just brushed it. Simple as that. So then after a couple more days in the lagoon, we, we leave San Ignacio Lagoon. And I guarantee even after all that time there, you'll be pleading with me to stay just one more day. Um, and there's a lot more to see. Let's do it again. Wiggle, wiggle. So basically then we, we start travelling and we'll live on the boat for the next... Um, the rest of the trip. Uh, we spent a bit of time off Magdalena Bay, not for the grey whales, but that's a, a big feeding ground for blue whales and other species. I'll go all the way down to the southern tip. Um, and off the southern tip, there's a breeding ground for humpback whales that we'll stop at and have a look at. And then just we'll explore up as far as that little island there, which is Santa Catalina Island. Um, and then we come back down and uh, we fly back from Cabo San Lucas. So let me just really quickly give a little insight into what we see, and hopefully this will bring back happy memories, those of you who've been um, during our travels on the Spiritual Adventure. We're pretty much on our own. There's one other boat that does a similar kind of trip, um, but most of the time we just don't see anybody. We're out there on the water with the whales on our own, just us and the wildlife. And part of the trip is, is basically travelling and just seeing what we come across. This is a group of grey whales that not quite bow riding, but we're just swimming along right in front of the boat at a steady pace. 
Um, these are spine-tailed devil rays we see quite a lot uh, right alongside the boat. This is a shot with a, a took with a drone of a, another thing we, we actually look for now because it's it's such a highlight of the trip. These are monks mobula rays. And uh, this is the best place to see them. This is actually in the Sea of Cortez. And they're famous for leaping. Um, here's a monk's mobula ray leaping. Something called monk's pygmy devil rays. They were named by a friend of mine, actually. He's an Italian uh, marine biologist. He's got a fantastic name himself. He's called Giuseppe Notovitalo de Ciara. And he named the monk's pygmy devil ray. And they do one or two or three or four leaps like that. No one knew for years what was going on, what it was all about, because they might do somersaults, land on their backs, big splash, as they might do several, others might do none. But because we've been filming them with the drone for years and sending this footage to Giuseppe, he's basically been looking at what might be going on. And the latest theory is that it's not a courtship display, because when you look from the drone, they leap and hit the surface of the water, and a lot of the, all the others around them just carry on swimming with their noses in the air, not taking any notice. So if it is a courtship display, it's not working. What we think it is now is it's bringing a school together for mating. So if you stay with the school, gradually it builds, the numbers build, and it's other mobile arrays coming in to build the school to such a size that then they all mate. So um, amazing little things, unexpected stuff like that. You wouldn't even dream of seeing a monk's mobular ray before you go on the trip, and then you go home and it's one of the highlights. Um, some species just find us. Humpback whales are so inquisitive. You know, they, they just come up to the boat and they have a, they're have they looking at us as much as we're looking at them as well. As I say, we, we do head to certain hot spots. So one big hot spot is off the southern tip of Baja, where there's a breeding ground for humpback whales. And we do often see mums and calves. There's a female with a calf um, called Gordon Banks. It's two uh, submarine mountains, if you like. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful place to watch them. There's often a lot of them there. Uh, all sorts of different behaviour. They can be quite active at the surface. Uh, this one's lobtailing right next to the boat. And say, if, if you get a nice calm day, like we often do, you can see them underwater. Uh, it's, 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 it's a really lovely, lovely way to spend a day. Humpbacks are, are pretty exciting whales to watch as well. They, they always seem to be doing something. I remember Herman Melville in Moby Dick, which was mainly about sperm whales, but he described humpback whales as the most gamesome and lighthearted of all the world's whales, making more gay foam and white water than any of them. And that sums them up perfectly. Uh, they were doing something at the surface. This is a mother humpback whale, another lesson, this time teaching it how to do lobtailing, how to hit the water with its tail. I think the, the baby's doing pretty well in that one is an adult doing a tail breach where it leaps out of the water backwards, makes a huge splash. And we often see lots of breaching. Some is doing it repeatedly, breach after breach after breach. One of the things we particularly look for when we go to Gorda Banks is, is fighting. Now, we think of, of whales as gentle giants, but when it gets to breeding, it all changes. So the males will fight one another over the females, and it can be really quite dramatic to watch. So they're in what are called rowdy groups. This is another shot from the drone. You can see the males fighting. There's a male underneath blowing bubbles, um, which is uh, the, the sort of lead male, the primary escort, we call him. And ahead of him, just out of shot, is the female. And they're basically all fighting one another for prime position to make the female. And seeing that at the surface is very exciting as, indeed. So we, we do go around looking for these rowdy groups. And it all works because... You do see lots of females with calves. Here's a very young, relatively newborn humpback calf. Another thing we do while we're there is to drop a hydrophone overboard. And another thing the humpbacks do is sing this amazing, it's the, it's the longest, most complex song in the animal kingdom. We, we listen, you can maybe just make out a humpback whale below the hydrophone there. Or we just sit on deck in the sunshine, and have this listen, this wonderful live humpback whale concert. Very, very moving experience. So another hotspot is right at the end on the left-hand side. You'll see a little couple of little islets just off the main islands there. And that's a big California sea lion rookery, which we go and visit. Um, great place to see them, get really nice and close to them. And one of the highlights here is snorkeling with them. 
So we'll get in the water with the sea lions and they're very inquisitive and actually really quite mischievous. Might try and take your fin off your foot. Or um, if you've got a GoPro camera, might put the GoPro camera in its mouth. That's a pretty amazing down the throat shot of a California sea lion. Well, we see other seals and sea lions as well. There's, a, there's another hot spot in the Sea of Cortez to see this species, which is the Guadalupe fur seal. It's one of only three places really on the planet you can go to see them. One is Guadalupe, where the great white sharks are. Another one is San Benitos, further north on the Pacific coast of Baja. And then this little islet, which they've just started to um, inhabit. But the last time we were there, I think we counted a thousand of them on Las Animas with, with, with protection. The Guadalupe fur seal is bouncing back and we're seeing that happen. One of the great things is we've seen things like Guadalupe fur seal and humpback whale and quite a few other species increasing in number dramatically as they're given um, proper protection. And we see more and more every time we go. We do sometimes stumble upon whale sharks as well, um, but there are a couple of hot spots. One in particular we tend to go to to get better views of them. And it's another great opportunity to, uh, to snorkel, um, jump in the water with them. This is in La Paz Bay, and you can get a nice close encounter with a whale shark as a little bit of icing on the cake. And if you don't like snorkeling, then you can watch them from a boat. So I'm running out of time. I'm going to whiz through. This is just to give you an idea, the risk of having a sort of list, an idea of some of the whale species that we, we typically see on one of these trips. This is a, a say whale. Uh, that's a brooder's whale. We don't often breach. I've only seen them breach at one occasion, but we see a lot of brooder's whales. Uh, I've already mentioned fin whales. It's a fin whale mum and calf in the Sea of Cortez. We often see sperm whales. They're the big ones and, and others as well. Um, and then we see a lot of more unusual species. So if you get a really nice calm day, there's a few places we go to we know are pretty good for dwarf sperm whales. And we can see them uh, on a calm day pretty easily. And this is one of my favourites. Everyone laughs at me because every time we see this, um, I do get a bit excited. This is a Peruvian or pygmy beaked whale. And... Uh, the guy who named this species, again, I won't tell you the whole story, is another friend of mine with a great name, a beaked whale expert, Kuhn van Verabeek. And last time I spoke to him, he'd never seen one of these. He'd only seen them dead, and that's how he named the species. Where we go, there's one particular hotspot in the Sea of Cortez. We see them regularly. If it's, uh, if it's calm, we can usually find them. Not every trip, but most trips. And it's the only place where you can go with a better than average chance of seeing a, a pygmy beaked whale. That's a male. Uh, occasionally see other things like a false killer whale. Uh, we often see short fin pilot whales. This is another short fin pilot whale. About once a season, we see killer whales. This is one, this was actually, I took when we were filming and it is carrying a squid eye in its beak. It actually presented the squid eye to the boat and dropped it there for us to fish out, almost like a, like a dog dropping a stick right in front of us. And then a whole host of different dolphins, Pacific white-sided dolphins, big schools of, of common dolphins. It's always worth looking in those schools. This is a, a spinner dolphin that happened to be amongst that school of common dolphins. Got to check, make sure they are all the same species. Some fantastic fatal opportunities with a lot of these animals because they're coming so close to the boat. A lot of them are, are bow riding. So often during the trip, we have bow riding dolphins, and that's a that's a typical view of the bow. Everyone leaning over watching the dolphins. Another wonderful experience. Lots of bottlenose dolphins. They tend to be in smaller groups, but they love playing around boats. They'll often bow ride, and um, they love playing in the wake as well. So here's some bottlenose dolphins leaping about in the wake. And I've left the, the, the best in a way till last. I mean, how do you say the best? Maybe not better than the grey whales. But I think one of the other species everybody wants to see is the largest animal. It's actually the largest animal ever to have lived on Earth, the blue whale. And this is, Baja is one of, if not the best place on the planet to see blue whales. I mean, we're talking about an animal that's average size blue whale is the length of a Boeing 737. The longest blue whale ever recorded was 110 foot three inches long. And the heaviest, 190 tons. 
I mean, you've got to be a lump of rock not to be moved by a close encounter with the blue whale. And I have to say, we, we've we got a not quite a 100% success rate. I mean, when I look back at the records from, from all the trips I've done there, one trip we didn't see blue whales, but all the others we did, and many of them we've seen many, many different blue whales, so many, in fact, that we leave blue whales to go and see other species. Um, that's a blue whale fluking. That's an arty farty shot of a blue whale fluking. And there's one coming close to investigate the boat. We'll often just travel alongside them um, for a long, long time. They're not bothered by the boat at all. If you approach nice and slowly and carefully, often they will come in and have a look and uh, stay right there. If you just carry on a straight line, blue whale will stay there. That was one of the best encounters I've ever had, I have to admit. I mean, you don't get that every trip. We saw this blue whale had been with us for a while and it dived down. And then next we saw it coming up. The water was so clear from the depths. And I was thinking, oh, my God, it's going to come up right underneath the bow. It is. It is. Normally, of course, then it would just dive away. But it surfaced right underneath the most amazing view for everybody. That was exceptional. But I think one thing I would say about these trips is that every single time we go, we see something new, something different, something we've never seen before, something exceptional, as well as all the stuff we'd expect. And that was the exceptional sighting of that particular trip. OK, I've talked way too long. can promise loads of great sunsets and sunrises. Um, the light for photography in Baja is, is wonderful. Um, and I haven't even mentioned, even though I've been talking fast and showing lots of pictures, haven't even mentioned loads of the stuff we see. So I hope you got an idea why I and Chris and so many other people love it so much. I, I definitely never tire of going, counting the days till the next trip, which is March next year. It really is one of the most extraordinary wildlife watching places on the planet. So yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Josh, Mark, thank you very, very much indeed. What an amazing, um, what an amazing review of uh, of Baja. Um, I mean, I sort of talked a bit fast because I, I, I could I could talk about it for days and still not cover everything. So as I was going through, I think, oh, my God, I, I, there's too much to talk about. So at least it gives a bit of a taste of the variety and, you know, all the different stuff that we tend to see. Uh, but it's such an incredible place, though, isn't it? That it, it it is endless, and 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 I I kind of I mean your photographs, obviously, or rather I should say the photographs you've shown this evening, I mean are all amazing, but, uh, but uh, they've say. been they've been taken over many years, right? Well, they have, but I mean, and I'm not just saying this. I mean, th there are fantastic opportunities because you you get. The whales come to the boat, you know, the, the grey whales are right there. How can you not get wonderful pictures of those? Gray, even you've got good pictures of those grey whales. In yeah, that's outrageous it. saying that. Of course um, and, um, you know, we get so many encounters during a trip, so much of a wildlife, often right there. It, it's actually hard not to, I mean, I, I'm, I'm working on a book of my favourite photos of Baja at the moment, of 30 years of that Baja trip. I'm doing a, a coffee table book and I, I've taken, I, I looked 1.1 million pictures oh. over the years um, and I've got to pick 130 for the book. So to pick those for tonight, honestly, I didn't, I just went through mostly the last few years. It's just impossible to look at everything. So, I mean, um, yeah, it's wonderful for photo, for photography. It's a, it's a, it is a, um, a, a whale photographer's paradise, isn't it? I mean, it's a photographer's paradise. But it's a whale photographer's paradise, yeah. too, I would say. Um, it's, uh, I mean, the light is wonderful. Um, the colour of the sea, of course, is, uh, it, it, the, the sea always seems to be a beautiful colour there. Um, wherever you are, I should say, the ocean um, and in the Sea of Cortez, it's fantastic. But you need a skillful captain, don't you, um, on the boat in order to be able to enable such lovely encounters like that like the one with the with the blue whale and and um and some of the other encounters well, that you do had. i mean we we've been working with the same crew for donkey's years and um they know the the region inside out and you know sometimes they've been on whale watching trips and been thinking oh my god we're going too close or we're going too fast or we're hanging off too far and it's it's frustrating sometimes but with with these guys 
it's all instinctive. They they are really we've got the time, so we're not rushing around. We've not got to clock in anywhere any particular day. You know, we want to go to those particular hot spots, but we've got the time. If we find something good, we just stay with it, and we're not rushing around. We take lots of time to see how the whales reacting. If they're obviously not keen on the boat, we'll just leave them to it. Um, but more often than not, they're very relaxed. And we actually, one of the things we do, which is very unusual, is we follow them underwater with the the um, sonar. Oh. We don't do that with the toothed whales because it disturbs their echolocation. A lot of work's been done on this, and the sonar doesn't affect the baleen whales like like greys, humpbacks, blues, fin, brooders, that kind of thing. So by following them underwater with the sonar, which is pretty tricky, takes mm. not even year, decades of practice. We are with it the whole time. So we're not waiting for it to surface over there or over there. We're just slowly following it as it dives. And then when it comes up, we're already there. So oh, we're not racing around cool. everywhere. So the whales relax really quickly. And, um, you know, as I say, if we, if we feel they're not relaxed, we'll just leave them be, of course. But most of the time, it's it's a nice, slow, long encounter. That's that's really great to know. Um we've we've had all sorts of interesting questions as you can imagine um because these talks and presentations always uh always um are of great interest and people come up with all sorts of interesting things now you mentioned touching the whales yeah and um i've been there i've done it i know what it's like um you and i've been there together um playing with the whales um but one or two people have asked questions about that and i guess it might just be worth touching on that again because i know i've done one or two talks and presentations and i i comment on it and every now and again there's a great in drawing of breath yeah. um but it really is amazing isn't it and it, and on all the occasions i've done it i've never felt even slightly um even slightly as if we're imposing on their territory as it were they 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 absolutely come to the boats to play with us as opposed to us being out yeah. there playing with them i don't know if it might just be worth elaborating on that well bit. sure i mean i mean you're the same as me but there's no way in, in a million years if i thought it was causing any harm there's absolutely no way i would do it and encourage people to do it um if we if we're on the water and there's we see a mother nursing a calf or we see a mating group we will we'll hang right back um, the rest of the time when they're just milling around, what we do is we go out and we'll stop and wait and we'll move on a bit. And we'll look for different individuals, see how they're behaving. And most of the time, it's them coming to us. Yeah. I mean, they actively come to us. If, they, if, if a whale doesn't want to come to those small boats, it will just disappear. Yeah. There's no way we could chase after them. They'd just disappear. It's this murky water there. They would go and we'd never see them again. Um, and as you say, it's entirely on their terms. And, you know, given that we've been doing it for what's 1972 to now, 50 years, mm. and researchers have looked into it in great detail, um, and there's no evidence at all of any harm. And as I said in the, in the talk, there's a lot of evidence of some good that it's doing. Um, I personally don't see a problem with it, I, and I feel comfortable with it. I know researchers there who feel comp everyone feels completely comfortable with it and they devote their lives to working with those whales. There's no yeah. way they'd encourage something that harms them. Um, but I do think you draw the line at grey whales. I definitely wouldn't advocate, right, it works for grey whales, let's touch other things, because it's a, it's a whole different kettle of fish. Yeah. Um, and as I said, you know, if it wasn't for this behaviour, that there's a very good chance there'd be a horrible old uh, salt extraction plant on the shores of the lagoon and there'd be no whales there at all and it's like it's like a lot of ecotourism arguments you know is that it's always a compromise having those friendly gray whales attracts people to the lagoon you know we pay good money for the fishermen to take us out and they're the strong voice protecting the lagoon from all sorts of other diverse potential threats um so the whales basically earning their keep is, is a is a brutal way of putting it but i think you have to be realistic about these things and it's a i think it's a happy compromise to make um and it, it, it i don't know anybody who knows about it being there understands what's happening who disagrees with it 
And is there uh, is there still a threat to the to the lagoon from the point of view of the salt extraction plant? It, or yeah, has that it's gone, gone away. But it, I mean, there, there's a lot of effort now to buy up the shores of the lagoon in pockets and make it you know much more difficult to do anything. It's a uh, it's definitely an issue still, and whether it'll raise its ugly head as a formal proposal or not, we don't know. It's, it's like anything in conservation, you know, you, you can't just say right, that's done draw a line under that, we'll move on and do something else. You've got to keep watching over your shoulder all the time. And it it does still get mentioned. So it, it's definitely not gone away permanently. So, so one, 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 well, many questions. I've got pages of them. Um, but oh, uh, we, through a few. <laughs> we won't get through them all. Um, best time of year for whale watching. Well, obviously we're going at the best time, but again, it might be worth elaborating on that. Of course, there is... The the other trip you did you did mention the other vessel of course which yeah. does something very similar, um, which is the searcher. Sorry, I had a mental block there for a second. Um, which is searcher? It's a very similar vessel, um, but best time of year to be there. Well, it's a very short season for the whole region. You know, not just the breeding grounds, the breeding grounds as well. So February through to mid April is the season, mid February to mid April roughly. And um, we're going there bang in the middle in March. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, grey whales in San Ignacio Lagoon. Um, any other whales that people would see in the lagoon? Well, until a few years ago, I'd have said no, definitely not. <laughs> but actually, bizarrely, humpback has been in a couple of times and killer whales have been in twice. So that, that's a slight worry. Nobody's sure what's going on because they came in and they killed, a, one occasion I think they killed a bottlenose dolphin and one occasion they killed a grey whale calf. Um, it hasn't become a regular thing at all and everyone's hoping it was a, a blip, a one-off for some reason because obviously that would cause chaos. One of the reasons yeah. probably they're breeding in the lagoon is it's safe from killer whales. And it may well just have been a particularly high tide there's a shallow entrance, which is tricky for the boats and the whales to get across. You've got to time it right and go through channels. So it may have been an opportunistic thing. We don't know. Apart from that, no, there, there's a little resident population of about 100 bottlenose dolphins in the lagoon, and we do see those. I have to remind everybody, you know, normally if there's 100 bottlenose dolphins in a lagoon, everyone would be going there to see them. Mm -hmm. Because all the focus is on these friendly grey whales, I have to remind everybody not to ignore the bottom of those dolphins. Otherwise, if they get hurt, you've got to, got to you know, <laughs> cheer them on as well. They're, they're almost like they're, they're just a, a sideshow sometimes. It's, it's a bit sad, really. And, and, and how many whales would there be in the lagoon at any one time? I mean, there's a lot. It depends on that. depends to some it, extent. It, it varies. In, when, when I used to do the aerial surveys, the most I ever saw was just under 600. That's really exceptional. If you go in hoping to see... 80 to 100 that, in that little area, that would be a pretty good day. Um, and it varies a lot from day to day. But, you know, we've been in there um, one year. We were there right at the end of the season and there were hardly any, but they were all friendly. I think there were like eight pairs, mum and calf pairs. They'd all left early for some reason. And um, they were all super friendly. We were being mugged by them every time we went out. <laughs> we had we had an encounter actually we may have been together um we had an encounter towards the end of the season where we had six mum and calf pairs around one of the boats um and another six mum and calf pairs waiting to come in when the first six had had um finished playing it's amazing so we were sort of you know trying to reverse trying to reverse out because it was a slightly uh I think that one of the drivers was getting a bit uncomfortable. One of the boat drivers, fishermen, was getting a bit uncomfortable about it, but because there were so yeah. many, there were just so I many. Mean, it's, it's hard to put into words, isn't it? I mean, you sort of describe it in figures like that, but it's an overwhelming experience. Yeah, it is absolutely overwhelming experience. I couldn't agree more. Um, maybe we can have just have a bit of a chat about um, the sea and uh, roughness or otherwise <laughs> of the sea. Um, slightly different depending on which trip you do. Um, but, uh, I mean, to some extent, it depends on 
there's an element of luck of the draw, isn't there? Of course, but yeah, um, it, I mean, it is luck of the draw, and and it's the seed, so it's, it's really hard to give a firm answer. Generally speaking, um, the, uh, north of San Ignacio is when you're most likely to get swell, um, and then you sort of you're sheltered a little bit as you as you go south of there. When you're out on the Pacific, you can get some swell. Um, and, and occasionally we get, you know, people being seasick and so on, on that stretch of the journey. It can be completely flat, calm. Sea of Cortez tends to be much, much calmer. If you've got wind, then it can pick up. You don't get the swell, but you get choppy seas. But um, they're sort of worst case scenarios. I mean, I've, I've done many trips when it's been pretty flat, calm most of the trip as well. So it's um, it's hard to generalise. It's middle of the season and um going from San Ignacio the odds of having calm seas most of the trip are pretty good and I think it's also worth saying one or two there's a number of people that are asking about um seasickness there are these rather tremendous patches that you can put behind your ear um that appear at least to make a fairly significant yeah. difference for those people that have they, work, they work pretty well like you only got to use one which occasionally people put two on and it makes you go completely do lally we have to rugby tackle you to the ground and take one <laughs> off but uh, they're that effective so just one but yeah i mean it's um i mean i get seasick sometimes I'm, i i think a couple of times i have on those trips but um as you said luck of the draw most of the time it's pretty good and certainly the sea of cortez is generally pretty good and in san ignacio lagoon where we have a total of five days you know you if you get wind you can get a little bit of white caps and so on but you don't get the swell that makes no. you feel sick no um and um could you tell us a little bit about the facilities on board um spirit uh and yeah. i know this would also apply actually to the facilities on board searcher which is the other vessel doing the departure from yeah. San Diego. But... so um as i said in the talk they're, they're small cabins and there's no, no denying it no portholes they're clean and comfortable, um, but they're small. Um, so you basically store your stuff and you sleep. You definitely don't lounge around in the cabins like you would on a luxury cruise. Um, and then we spend a lot of time, as much time as possible, out on deck, which I've already said is fantastic, yeah. big and spacious. Um, and there's a big galley where we all eat. So we all sit around different tables eating. There's... Um, Oh my god, but I'm on the wrong um wavelength. There's four, one, two, three, five tables on the spirit. And we just distribute in little groups and move around every night. And then the galley overlooking all the tables. Um and the food is superb. I mean, I'm not kidding, it's really, really good, hearty, healthy food. Um and you know, lots of coffee on the go and what have you. Um we all have a glass or two of wine in the evening it's, it's a comfortable clean but not luxurious experience and i think so i've mentioned searcher which is the other vessel uh, we i mean i've been on both um although i haven't done the voyage on spirit but have done search once or twice and i know you know you've been on searcher as well um on searcher at least one or two of the cabins have very small windows but yeah. i mean very small windows about the diameter of a um a large loo roll probably would be about the size of, <laughs> about the size of a port that's not, what was the other? a very evocative way of describing it. <laughs> so, well, i know what you mean. and the other thing to say is that um there are three showers and four loos and it sounds limited and it is but it's amazing how after 24 the first 24 hours is a bit chaotic everybody trying to stick to their home routines but once you'll get into a different system yeah, it's completely fine. It's amazing how quickly that works. Everyone gets used to it. And I do know people who, who don't like that, don't like showing them, but they've been back, I won't name any names, one 11 times and one 13 times on that trip. And they still don't like the limited lose, but it's a tiny price to pay. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Um, uh in, in answer to one of the questions that we've had, no, the cabins don't have ensuite facilities. Um, as, as Mark has just explained, they are, the facilities are shared. Um, but 
it's a pretty efficient system. It all works. Right. And they're all clean all the time. They're super clean and hot yeah. water all the time and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's amazing how you just slot into a little routine and it becomes a bit of a, a joke. You know, everybody works around one another. And like I said, after 24 hours, it's all fine. Hey, do you reckon you need to be fit to go on this trip? Um, well, you're on it, so... Not fit in terms of... We do go, what I didn't say, of course, is we do go ashore sometimes. Yeah. Um, we go to look for the hummingbirds and we go to and other birds and we, we look at some whale fossils and just the stretch legs and so on. I mean, the focus is the whale watching, but we definitely go to a few lovely places ashore. And it's not great hikes, not difficult hikes, not difficult terrain. They're all very straightforward. The only thing is... Um, with both vessels, there are um, just a few fairly steep stairs with handrails um, between the, the lower deck where all the cabins are and the, the main sort of deck with the galley and the main um, outside deck. So if, you, if you're fine going up those stairs, up and down those stairs, then you have no trouble at all. No, and, and, and I guess it's probably also worth just mentioning about getting on and off spirit and getting on and off searcher yes <laughs> instead of so getting into the skiffs that sort of typifies the crew so with the boats in the lagoon there's a, a, a ladder from the deck so there's, there's there's people at the top of the ladder and two people at the bottom just to make sure you safely get in the boat and it's just and again there's no rush it's all very relaxed and you know nobody feels under any pressure at all and you just help down the, the little ladder step onto the seats and then onto the deck and you're sitting in the boat so yeah. it's um yeah it's 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 pretty straightforward and, and lots of care and attention to make sure everybody feels completely comfortable yeah okay um a number of people on board the boat 27 plus me and rachel who works with me plus seven crew okay so it's a nice, Sorry, it's not a nice no 24 what am i saying 24 passengers Rachel, How many years have you been doing it? Crew. Sorry, I was, <laughs> I was sort of adding up with Rachel and me and then got all confused. You're confusing me. Sorry, sorry, sorry. 24 very plus question. 2 plus 7. Yeah. Um, and um, I think probably uh, that the last question, um, unless you can think of anything else that we should be asking or that perhaps people should have asked, but um, I think we've gone through all sorts of different things and... Uh, We'll be sending further information out to people who have who have requested it. Um, but there have been a number of people that have asked about camera equipment um, mm -hmm. and lenses and so on. I think uh, that's perhaps quite a good one to um, to end on. Um, well, there's lots of room, so I take lots of camera kit. Mm -hmm. um, so you can take whatever you want. Um, there's loads of room. You can lay it all out inside. People lay it on tables and run in and out and get what they need. So if you've got lots of kit, bring it. Um, if you want to limit it or you've just got one camera, I, the, the sort of it's hard to know. In the lagoon, a wide angle lens is good because the whales are so close. So I'm often shooting, not even looking through the viewfinder, just holding a camera out there, photographing the whales from sometimes inches away. Um, and then for the rest of the trip, you know, I, I would say as an average uh, telephoto lens, 300 would be good. If you've got a 400, that would be good. If you've got a zoom, 70 to 300 or 100 to 400, even better. And that and the wide angle lens, which you'd also use for bow riding dolphins and that kind of thing. So that combination of the two would be absolutely spot on, perfect. And if you've got a GoPro, bring a GoPro, because we can often film whales and dolphins underwater. We, on long poles from the boat. We've got those you can borrow. Um, and, you know, we snork with the sea lions and the whale sharks and stuff. So bring a GoPro as well. Mark, that is absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a tremendous um, reminder of how utterly amazing Baja is. It's a, it's a fantastic, fantastic place. I cannot recommend it highly enough. Um, I'm also looking forward to going there next year uh for those of you that um want to join us again we'll be talking about brazil helen brian very popular helen brian will be talking about brazil on the 25th of october as you can see on that slide you've got on your screen 
Um, and we'll be talking about wildlife highlights in India on the 1st of November. Um, but Mark, thank you once again. Um, it's been absolutely super. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody for giving up your evening to um, listen to Mark uh, talk about Baja. Yeah, thank see you, you, thank very, you very much. I'm sorry I couldn't see you all. I'll find out afterwards who was watching. Um, but uh, I'd, I'd love to have seen you. But thanks very much for coming along. Good stuff. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Bye. All. Bye.